right, it has gone one o'clock and we've got a few people in the um, Zoom session now. So I'll go ahead and start talking. My name is Dr. Julia Kazmaier and I'm the lead of the Computational Social Science Training Team at the UK Data Service. So we're really interested in getting social scientists and computational scientists to work together to combine their forces and um, achieve social science research, research projects uh, with computational methods, you know, just try and hit some of those really big questions from a new angle. And today is the guest lecture portion of our agent-based modeling training series. I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Kavan Narashaman. I think I got that wrong. Uh, she is a research fellow working at the intersection of computational science and social science. And she has a very interesting real world application of agent-based modeling. So please um, take it away. Thanks, Julia. Uh, just checking everybody's able to hear me. Excellent. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. As Julia mentioned, I am Kavin. I am a research fellow at the Center for Research in Social Simulation at the University of Surrey. Uh, I'm also an ESRC policy fellow, um, currently doing a secondment role as data social scientist uh, at Bayes. Um, in today's seminar, I would like to talk about the what, why, how, and for whom aspects of our agent-based model called watering uh, used to explore decentralized water management uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and share our experiences, uh, reflections, and some resources uh, from our research. I do hope to go through all of the different phases uh, we went through to develop the agent-based model but I'm sure there will be time uh, at the end uh, for questions and hopefully also to play with some of the sub models uh, that we have created from uh, watering. So uh, let's get started. So the one percentage uh, accessible fresh water that's available on our blue planet, which is almost 70 percentage of water, must meet the water demand of almost 7.8 billion people. Uh, water management in simple term uh, deals with how one plans and implements the rules and processes uh, to store, divert and supply uh, water to water users. Uh, irrigation management specifically uh, relates to water use principally for agriculture, but there may be other uses too, uh, like domestic consumption and uh, livestock consumption. In the 1950s and 60s, uh, governments, international donors, and development banks uh, invested in large-scale, centrally managed irrigation systems worldwide. Uh, many of these irrigation systems underperformed or failed altogether uh, due to improper planning, uh, poor maintenance, as well as overlooking uh, the local needs and traditions of uh, farmers and communities as such. There are many examples in literature where such causes caused the failure of irrigation systems uh, like the Mesopotamian civilization, or more recently, uh, the case of barley rice terraces, where overlooking the uh, locally coordinated uh, cropping plans and rituals of rice farmers uh, organized in cooperatives called subaks uh, led to severe crop losses. Uh, the Green Revolution in Bali was around 1971. Uh, so other failed cases of centralized uh, irrigation management around the world uh, in sort of a similar time uh, frame spurred the irrigation management reforms uh, in the 1970s. And then further push uh, for decentralized water management came in the 1990s with the integrated water resources management paradigm, which many countries signed up for, essentially suggesting that fresh water is a limited resource, so water management uh, should use participatory approaches um, involving water users, planners, and decision makers, and that water has an economic value uh, in all competing uh, users. Many developing economies have huge demand for fresh water for agriculture. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, where we conducted our case studies uh, specifically, uh, the demand for fresh water for agriculture is significantly higher uh, than other sectors, as you can see in this uh, plot. 
uh, and there is huge potential for irrigation, estimated to be around 34 million hectares, uh, but only around 10% of cultivated land in uh, sub-Saharan Africa is irrigated. So governments, donors, and private sector investors are all keen to support irrigation development in the region. And decentralized water management is considered central to the irrigation expansion efforts. Decentralized water management broadly means uh, water allocation and supply is handled within local communities with occasional or no technical and uh, financial support from uh, external actors once the project is live. There are further nuances to decentralized water management in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Firstly, there are differences based on how water is used for cultivation. Uh, there is traditional rain-fed farming where seasonal floods or rainwaters are utilized for growing crops. And then there is irrigation farming. And within that, we have farmer-led initiatives or uh, donor or state-sponsored schemes. Uh, Farmer-led irrigation schemes refer to smallholder farmers organized in small groups, and they use uh, small affordable pumps uh, to grow high-value produce uh, such as vegetables. Uh, on the other hand, we have the sponsored schemes uh, where state entities uh, such as the Ministry of uh, Food and Agriculture or an Irrigation Development Authority or other external donors uh, would fund and implement large scale irrigation systems and then often hand over operation maintenance and management responsibilities to community level groups. The scheme level groups responsible for routine water management are uh, referred to as water user associations or UAS in short. So uh, UAS are semi-formal or informal institutions. Usually sponsored schemes have semi-formal UAS and formal-led schemes have uh, informal UAS. Uh, Semi-formal UAS have institutional mandates, which mainly focus on uh, allocating water to users, uh, the operation and maintenance of the irrigation system, uh, as well as collecting fees and fines from uh, farmers and other members. Uh, informal UAS often work towards similar objectives, even if they don't have a mandate as such. UAS are generally small scale with only a few hundred members each. Uh, previous research suggests that was often struggle to fulfill their mandates. The main reasoning is that there is an expected feedback loop whereby improving irrigation performance uh, through the provision of irrigation systems would boost agricultural productivity and income and thereby encourage users to comply with UA regulations and pay water fees regularly. However, this expected feedback loop uh, is disrupted by several factors. Uh, most notably, uh, the limited financial resources, uh, the technical and management expertise of UAS, whose authorities are often uh, elected members of the local communities. Uh, furthermore, there are conflicts between competing water users and wider issues related to uh, limited inputs and market opportunities for crop production, rigid water bureaucracies, um, and so on. But despite all these challenges in implementing decentralized water management through UAS, uh, efforts are ongoing to expand irrigation and introduce UAS or turn existing collectives uh, such as farmers unions and village committees uh, into UAS. Against this backdrop, there is a recognized need to understand how UAS operate and explore management options uh, that can improve uh, outcomes for UAS farmers and more broadly uh, the local communities uh, but it is a significantly expensive and uh, time-consuming task to do this research in real world uh, whereas computer simulations provide a tractable uh, and cheaper alternative to study the system but to build meaningful computer simulations we always need real world data Due to practical constraints involved in collecting this data, we decided to focus on exploring specific aspects of UAS. Uh, we particularly wish to understand how does participatory irrigation management work uh, through UAS. Uh, participatory is the key word here, as we were specifically interested in understanding and uh, experimenting uh, through our simulations how varying levels of participation, cooperation, and conflicts among water users 
uh, would affect water use, irrigation management, uh, and economic productivity within a UA catchment area. Our second question was, uh, which UA management option uh, is better for performing the, uh, for improving uh, the economic productivity of uh, water users and the UA itself? And here the key words are management option, which in simple words means the arrangements uh, to store, divert and deliver water to uh, end users. So we started our work with field work to help us define the scope and the boundary of the system to model. Uh, this helped us develop a narrative of decentralized water management through UAS and understand if there is data available uh, that we could use to calibrate and validate our model or to see if it's feasible to collect such data. Uh, we conducted semi-structured interviews with different WUA members, representatives, and extension offices, uh, all mostly within the Upper East region of Ghana, particularly near Bolgatanga, as is shown on the map. Uh, we also interviewed researchers based in Accra, uh, Ghana, and elsewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa and internationally, who have all worked with UAS uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Some key insights uh, emerged from our fieldwork. Uh, firstly, we got to know that water use is not exclusive to farmers uh, in most, if not all, irrigation schemes. Households who live within the catchment area of irrigation schemes and pastoralists also tend to use water. At the same time, it's fuzzy whether households and pastoralists can be UA members and pay water fees. Some UA say that they cannot be members and thus should not use water and don't have to pay fees, while others feel that households and pastoralists use water anyway, so they might as well be UA members and pay fees. A uh, few was commented that water is for everyone, uh, so pastoralists and households should not be charged. Um, even if they use water. Uh, further complexity arises from some farmers who are not OA members using water from the scheme for irrigation, but not paying for it. Uh, we have classified such farmers as independent irrigators. Their water use can be significant and it can cause severe water stress uh, to the scheme, uh, especially during periods of water scarcity. Uh, the different types of water users and uses within a scheme uh, sometimes prompts conflicts among the water users and between water users and the UA. And finally, uh, even within similar uh, schemes in the same region, uh, there is no standard management template for uh, UAs on how uh, to allocate and supply water uh, to communities. So the system we wish to explore through computer, uh, through computer simulations looks somewhat like this. Uh, within each irrigation scheme, uh, ISAWA, it is responsible for water management, which involves allocating and supplying water according to demand, uh, collecting fees from members, conducting meetings, and resolving conflicts between water users. Uh, since an irrigation system is primarily uh, intended for agriculture, most UA members are farmers. They use water from the scheme, earn income by growing crops, uh, pay, uh, pay fees to the UA, and participate uh, in meetings to learn about UA policies uh, and how to comply with UA regulations. That said, Almost always there are other water users within the catchment of an irrigation scheme. They are pastoralists, households, and non-member farmers. Uh, non-member farmers might be independent irrigators who use water from the scheme but don't pay fees, or non-irrigators who engage in traditional rain-fed farming, uh, so they don't use irrigation and don't pay fees to work. Uh, pastoralists and households use water from the scheme for feeding livestock and for uh, household consumption respectively, uh, but they don't pay over fees. Uh, additionally, uh, pastoralists might be uh, forced to pay fines if their livestock destroy crops and uh, households could have a uh, random demand uh, for water for construction purposes. Uh, the technique uh, we wanted to use for the simulations was becoming apparent to us by this point as we developed the narrative uh, for the simulation. Uh, we understood that the system involves infrastructure, elements of human agency, and the ecology of the command area of an irrigation system. Uh, or in other words, we were trying to model a, a socio-ecological system. 
uh, and there are different types of actors within the system, each having a need uh, to use or manage uh, an essential shared resource, water in this case, uh, to meet the different objectives. Uh, in other words, we were dealing with a common poor resource problem uh, with issues of excludability and uh, subtractability. Uh, the system has uh, multiple potential causes for failures, especially in terms of exploitation and scarcity of resources, uh, but lacks even a partial causal explanation of how all of these different factors uh, contribute to specific outcomes. But this knowledge is essential uh, for improving decentralized water management uh, through UAS. Considering uh, there is also limited individual and UA level data on what demand and consumption, we needed a flexible modeling approach that was capable of working with reasonable theoretical assumptions uh, where uh, necessary. Finally, given that there isn't a standard UA template, we needed a modeling approach that would allow generating meaningful counterfactuals uh, to assess the impact of different management strategies uh, based on the settings provided. All of these considerations uh, made us to choose an agent-based modeling approach uh, for simulating uh, decentralized uh, water management through UAS. The agent-based model uh, that we have developed is called Watering. It stands for Water User Associations at the Interface of Nexus Governance. We hope it can be useful as a tool to explore and plan community-level water management. Uh, more specifically, we hope the model will allow its users to understand and explain the combined influence of UA policies and community participation on water use and income earned in an irrigation scheme. The agents in watering are farmers, pastoralists, households, and there's one OA agent. Uh, the environment is a simulated irrigation scheme uh, comprising a physical asset made up of a reservoir, a primary canal, and secondary canals. Watering also has a social environment uh, whereby neighboring water users uh, influence uh, each other. The watching model uh, is implemented in NetLogo. Uh, it is an empirically informed stylistic model, uh, meaning that uh, empirical data was used to inform model design, calibration, and validation. But the model itself is not a one-to-one -one representation of reality. Uh, we have made some sim simplifications uh, in the model. Namely, we only model surface irrigation where water flows by gravity. We assume that water is pumped up to the reservoir and canals and flows from the canals into the farm plots uh, by gravity. We have not modeled groundwater irrigation or irrigation methods like drip or uh, sprinkler systems. Uh, we made the simplification as many of the irrigation systems that we interviewed have surface irrigation. Uh, we also model only one UA within an irrigation scheme. Uh, large irrigation schemes could have multiple UAs, but we simplified because our focus was mainly to understand the dynamics of interactions between a UA and its uh, uh, member users. The next simplification uh, we made that uh, made is that each farmer cultivates one plot. In reality, uh, some farmers cultivated multiple plots and grow different crops, but we simplified to one plot per farmer. Uh, but the size of the plots uh, varies from less than a hectare up to a few hectares. Uh, we have also assumed that water users don't switch economic activity. In reality, if farmers or pastoralists in incur uh, any income losses, they might sell their farms or livestock and then take up another economic activity or migrate elsewhere. Uh, while farmers can uh, still sell or rent out their plots in the model and pastoralists can sell off their livestock, we have not modeled water users switching their economic uh, activity. Uh, rental markets and migration are complex systems in their own right, but since we only focus on one irrigation scheme, we decided not to model these aspects in the current version of uh, watering. We also made a simplified assumption uh, that only one crop can be grown per plot per season, uh, that is monocropping. While intercropping is possible, uh, smallholder farmers predominantly do monocropping. Uh, the model runs in monthly time steps. Each net logo tick represents one calendar month and uh, each simulation is around 20 years. The image you see in this slide is the net logo worldview of watering. There's a reservoir in the top left, a primary canal just below the reservoir, which runs across horizontally, 
and the three parallel secondary canals, which branch from the primary canal, that is the, the empty blue lines, that the parallel lines that you see. Uh, water users reside on the green patches. Uh, the varying shades of green indicate the different heights of patches. So darker the green, greater the height. Uh, water reaches the patches with the highest uh, elevation first, assuming that water is pumped up, and then flows to uh, patches with lower elevations. Uh, zooming into the image, uh, the plant icons that you see here are the scheme farmers who are UA members. The flower icons are non-irrigators. Uh, the tree icons are independent irrigators. The house icons are households and the livestock icons are pastoralists. Also seen in this image uh, is that scheme farmers are closer to the canals, uh, the empty blue line, uh, while independent irrigators, non-irrigators and households and pastoralists are further away. Uh, so this mimics the situation uh, in the irrigation schemes that we studied. In terms of crop water demand, uh, we model commonly grown dry season, uh, wet season and multi-season crops. Uh, for example, in the irrigation systems that we studied, tomato, maize and rice are commonly grown. Uh, while one crop can be grown uh, per season, up to two crops can be grown per year uh, since the duration of each crop we modeled is anywhere between 120 to uh, 180 days. Uh, the crop growth occurs in four stages, uh, initial development, mid-season and late season. The water requirement for crops uh, varies by growth stage. The duration of each crop and crop stages are set via the interface tab in the NetLogo model. Uh, we use the blaney Kirtle method to estimate crop water demand. It is a simple but commonly used approach to calculate crop water demand uh, based on data like mean monthly temperature, monthly percentage of annual daylight hours, and crop coefficient. Uh, we collected the necessary data for this from uh, existing climate data, set, uh, data sets and the FAO uh, irrigation manual. Uh, crop water demand can be met through irrigation, rainfall, or both, depending on the season. Uh, and lastly, the number and types of crop each farmer grows depends on their affiliation to the UA. For example, UA members have access to irrigation, so they can cultivate during both uh, dry and rainy seasons, whereas non-irrigators only cultivate during the rainy season and they choose the crops accordingly. Next, uh, in terms of uh, water demand for livestock and households, uh, pastoralists are agents in the model who have large numbers of uh, cattle, goats, and poultry. Some crop farmers also do livestock keeping, but they have fewer animals. Uh, the water demand for livestock is calculated based on the number, type, and average water demand uh, by type. The demographic characteristics of the household agents in our model is similar to the characteristics of the household uh, households in the irrigation schemes that we studied. Uh, the household water demand is calculated based on household size uh, and the average water demand per person. Household agents also have random use of water for construction uh, purposes. Normally, in the irrigation schemes we studied, UA member farmers are allowed to use water from the irrigation scheme for their livestock. But pastoralists who own large numbers of livestock are not UA members, so water demand for their livestock is not regulated by the UA. At times, this results in conflicts between water users. And even when UA members are willing to overlook the water consumption of livestock, uh, conflicts arise when livestock destroy crops. Uh, UA is expected to intervene in such situations to recover fines from pastoralists. We model these dynamics uh, in watering. We also model counterfactuals where pastoralists and households can become UA members uh, and pay fees for their water consumption. So uh, UA's management policies are set via the interface tab in the NetLogo model. Uh, and there are three options, uh, membership, water allocation, and strictness. Uh, the membership policy of UA can either be exclusive or inclusive. Uh, when set to exclusive, only scheme farmers can be UA members. So even if pastoralists and households use water from the scheme, they cannot become members and pay for their water use. This is what we see in most irrigation schemes. The counterfactual uh, is inclusive membership where scheme farmers, pastoralists and households can all become UA members and pay for their water use. In any case though, uh, independent irrigators and non-irrigators don't become UA members. Non-irrigators don't have to as they don't 
use water from the scheme, uh, but independent irrigators do use water, but they avoid membership and paying fees. Uh, the water allocation policy of UA can either be upstream downstream divide or equity. In the former, uh, upstream users get water first, followed by downstream users, whereas in the equity scheme, the amount of water available for irrigation is divided equally across the scheme. So in case of an acute water shortage, uh, we can expect that farmers or more broadly water users wouldn't be disadvantaged just by their downstream position. Uh, in terms of the strictness policy, uh, we can set one of three stances for the OA which controls how strictly it enforces the water allocation decisions on water users, limiting uh, how much users can draw more than their quota. Uh, enforce means full restriction on water use beyond quota. Uh, incentivize means limited restriction on water use beyond quota, or relaxed means uh, no restriction on water use uh, beyond quota. So in terms of the UA agents' actions, uh, each year UA estimates annual water demand by month based on the cropping patterns of farmers. UA also includes estimates of water demand from pastoralists and households if UA membership is inclusive. Uh, each month UA then allocates water to its members proportional to their demand based on the amount of water available in the scheme. Point to note here is that uh, UA's estimates and allocations are all based on the water demand of its members only. We assume that UA cannot know the demand arising from non-members because it won't be the same each month. Uh, and UA cannot keep track of all the uh, unregulated water use. This mimics the situation uh, observed in the irrigation scheme. Uh, the UA agent also collects fees and fines uh, and uh, uses its income for operation and maintenance tasks uh, in the irrigation scheme. Uh, UA loans money to its uh, members affected by income loss uh, to help them stay uh, in business. So uh, as we already saw uh, in terms of water users, there are uh, three main types of water users, uh, farmers, pastoralists, and households. And there are three subcategories of farmers, uh, scheme farmers, uh, independent irrigators, and non-irrigators. Uh, UA membership can be exclusive to scheme farmers or inclusive of scheme farmers, pastoralists, and households. Scheme farmers almost always form the majority of water users in the irrigation scheme. At the end of each year, water users are in one of three economic states, uh, depending on their economic position. Uh, all water users are active by default. Uh, they become inactive when their costs exceed their income. In line with observed data, uh, we have modeled that water users who remain inactive for more than three years uh, become obsolete. That is, they will cease economic activity. However, within three years of becoming inactive, users can go back to being active if they rent out their plots to other water users or borrow money uh, from UAS to start bis business again. So in terms of the water users' behavior, uh, they have some reactive behavioral stances. Uh, so each month, water users adopt a behavioral stance to either cooperate, which is CP, or not cooperate with the worst water allocations, NCP. If they cooperate, the chances are higher that they will comply uh, with worst water use quotas. If they do not cooperate, the chances are higher that they will withdraw uh, more than their quota. Uh, we assume that UA members cooperate if their water allocation exceeds their demand, their baseline demand. Uh, Non-members simply have a 50% chance of cooperating with uh, UA's water allocations. Once uh, water users have their behavioral stance, they will then calculate a utility to cooperate with UA's water allocations based on their own behavioral stance, the dominant behavioral stance of their neighbors, and the strictness position adopted by the UA. So in mathematical terms, the strictness of the UA is a factor uh, added to another factor which focuses on the neighborhood influence to determine uh, each water user's utility uh, to cooperate. Based on the utility to cooperate, each water user will then calculate the actual amount by which they would reduce their water demand. Uh, finally, any reduction in water demand as a result of this process has a proportionate effect on water users. For example, uh, less water results in reduced crop yields and lower income for farmers, 
and less water for livestock uh, results in poor health or uh, death of livestock. So based on our assumptions about the behavior, actions and decisions of the water users and the UA, which I have presented so far, we set up and ran NetLogo simulations using the integrated behavior space tool. Uh, we have already discussed the first three uh, model settings that you see in this slide. Uh, but additionally, we also included a setting to model damages caused by livestock. There is some damage to crop or infrastructure caused by livestock in several irrigation schemes. So true means livestock costs damages and false means livestock don't cause damages. But still, there's a random chance of infrastructure damage. Example, maybe it's due to age. Uh, finally, we have some settings controlling the duration, the frequency and the intensity of uh, irrigation events. The combination of the parameters and the parameter settings uh, in this slide resulted in 24 unique settings, which we ran 20, 10 times each, uh, resulting in 240 model runs in total. So before going on to look at the results, I will now show a quick demo of the watering model uh, implemented in NetLogo, uh, and then we'll go on to the results. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second and share the model. Uh, just a second. It's just taking a second to load. Okay, hopefully we should be able to see it now. There we go. Okay, uh, hopefully you are seeing the NetLogo model. Um, can I get a quick thumbs up? Excellent, thanks, <laughs> Julia. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, the watering uh, NetLogo model. Uh, so as you can see here on the left, we have most of the input settings and controls uh, that a user of the model can change uh, to kind of um, explore the different options that they would like to investigate using this as a tool. In the middle, uh, we see the NetLogo world. And on the right, we have the major output plots. We also have some controls further down below. Uh, so the model ships with these input controls. People can change it if they want to, or just leave it as it is and just explore uh, the effects of the main management uh, controls uh, here on the top left. So just quickly, if I set up, so I'm just setting the total irrigation allocation for uh, the scheme being 60%, meaning 60% of water available at source is allocated for irrigation. The rest could be used for other purposes. The scheme irrigation efficiency essentially is one factor that combines uh, the effect of multiple factors, like how effective is the infrastructure to retain the water, uh, like, what about water losses and things like that? Uh, the discharge rate controls at what rate water goes from the, the main outlets uh, into uh, the canals. The irrigation hours per day is the, the duration of each irrigation event. And uh, the irrigation days per month is the frequency of uh, uh, irrigation events uh, each month. So if I, I'm happy with these settings now, so if I just press go, uh, we see that water flows through the canals. There's, there was some orange line in between that indicated there was damage to the canal, which the world would then have had to uh, fix. So uh, the green and the yellow um, changing plant icons show here that whether or not a particular plot is actively cultivating, uh, the blue color of the patch indicates water flow to that patch. And on the right, we have uh, various outputs uh, resulting from the model. Some of the results I will discuss now uh, in a second. So um, hopefully that's just a quick demo of how uh, the watering model as such looks in its entirety. So now we'll go on to discuss uh, specific results. So I will pause this, stop share and go back to the slides. Okay, hoping we're back on the slides again. Excellent, thanks, Julia. So um, over the next few slides, uh, we will look at uh, some results from our watering simulations. So the result seen in this uh, slide shows that the average uh, shows the average annual income over a 20 year period, which is the duration of each model run of different categories of uh, farmers under different OA management policies. 
so the results here show that scheme farmers earn more than independent irrigators and non-irrigators, which is expected considering that they have better access to irrigation. Uh, non-irrigators uh, non -irrigators, um, earn the least, uh, which is also expected as they only cultivate uh, during the rainy season. Farmers earn more with an upstream downstream water sharing arrangement. Again, it is expected uh, as most independent irrigators who engage in unregulated water use are located downstream. But surprisingly though, uh, we found that uh, scheme farmers earn more when UA is relaxed and conversely, independent irrigators earn more if UA is strict. This happens because when UA enforces its decision of limiting water supply and scheme farmers are the ones who readily comply with UA's decisions, they suffer most water shortage, uh, which works to the advantage of independent irrigators who would abstract water anyway from the scheme. Uh, so in the event uh, UA is not able to control unregulated water use within a scheme, it might be better uh, if UA is less strict in rationing uh, its water supply to its members. The next slide seen here shows the average annual income of UA over a 20 year period of each model run under different UA management settings. Here we can see that the income trend is slightly reversed based on the water allocation stance and that UA actually earns more uh, under an equity arrangement. This is because more users make a marginal profit uh, under an equity arrangement and are thus able to pay UA fees compared to fewer users uh, making greater profit under an upstream downstream uh, divide scenario. But in terms of strictness, uh, it is also in UA's interest to be more relaxed with its uh, water allocations and avoid strict rationing to improve its income. With strict rationing, however, adopting an upstream downstream water sharing policy uh, better favors uh, UA income. The next slide uh, seen here shows the average annual income of UA over a 20 year period, but under two different uh, UA management settings. Uh, first is whether livestock frequently damage infrastructure or not. And second is UA membership being exclusive to scheme farmers or inclusive of scheme farmers, pastoralists and households. Uh, we find that UA has more income if livestock damages infrastructure, but this counterintuitive result stems from the model assumption that UA successfully recovers fines from pastoralists uh, if they are livestock damage infrastructure. If this is combined with UA membership being exclusive to scheme farmers, then UA has more income due to having to make fewer and lower payouts to support members who face income losses. Uh, but if livestock don't damage canals, though, uh, then UA has more income if membership is inclusive of uh, all water users. The results we see in this slide uh, is a radar plot uh, showing the performance of the three categories of farmers uh, against different measures. Uh, we find that even if their income is low, non-irrigators are more economically active than scheme farmers and uh, independent irrigators uh, as they have no water use costs uh, as such. Uh, we also find that scheme farmers are more water stressed than independent irrigators due to complying uh, more often with with uh, UA's water rationing decisions. Uh, but at the same time, we find that scheme farmers do have the highest yield productivity, uh, that is uh, crops harvested uh, per unit of water consumed uh, compared to independent irrigators and uh, non-irrigators. So based on all of these results, uh, going back to our research questions, uh, focusing on the role of participatory irrigation management through UAS and which management options work better to boost incomes, our simulation results suggest that uh, UA being relaxed about water users exceeding their quotas might improve the income of scheme farmers and potentially encourage them to continue participating and cooperating with UAS. This is true, especially uh, when unregulated water use is an issue that UA is aware of, uh, but is not able to control effectively, uh, as reported in some of the irrigation schemes that we studied. 
Uh, next is that why income is higher under the equity water sharing option because more members make just enough profits to pay UA fees compared to fewer members, predominantly the scheme farmers located upstream making higher profits in the upstream downstream water sharing scenario. Uh, another result is that UA membership being exclusive to scheme farmers is better when damages caused by livestock to crops or infrastructure is a prevalent issue and cannot be controlled or managed effectively by UAs through other means. Alternatively, if damages caused by livestock is not an issue to an irrigation scheme, then inclusive membership works to the advantage of both UA and its water users. So some expected and some surprising results here from our simulations, which helped unpack the conditions that lead to different outcomes. Of course, at this point, we had questions about the validity of the results and also bigger questions about what fair and sustainable water management is. So we needed a way to assess if watering has captured the key processes and dynamics, if it's doing the right things, and uh, if and how it could be a home uh, with, if and how it can find a home uh, with stakeholders um, involved in decentralized water management. Uh, individual or UA level data on water consumption and other aspects of participatory water management is hard to come by, like I mentioned at the start. And yet validation is a key step in the process of seeing agent-based models to completion, but the data required for validation may not be available at all, uh, be difficult to access or be, not be in the format that we need. And in these circumstances as modelers, I think we need to think carefully about how we think about the real world usefulness of our model. One way we did this is by organizing evaluation and knowledge exchange workshops with stakeholders and citizens in Ghana. We ran full day workshops using different methods to allow stakeholders and citizens to assess the, uh, the plausibility of the simulation results. But not just that, uh, we also conducted sessions through which we got participants to look under the hood of our model as it were, uh, getting their feedback on our assumptions and the way we implemented the model too. Uh, so here's an overview of how we did that. So we ran a participatory systems mapping session to develop a system level understanding of decentralized water management through OAS. Uh, the objective of the exercise was to encourage and help participants to think widely about factors and conditions affecting water management uh, and success of uh, OAS. Uh, I will illustrate the main steps in the participatory systems ma mapping activity here with a simple example. So we start off uh, by identifying the key factors. So the success of UAS was our focal factor that you see in the red box there, and the yellow boxes were the other factors which directly or indirectly influenced the focal factor. We then moved on to identifying key connections. So each factor has incoming and outgoing links depending on whether it influences or is influenced by um, another factor. Green arrows are positive connections, meaning if one factor increases, the connected factor also increases. Red arrow means negative connections, meaning if one factor increases, the connected factor decreases. Uh, gray arrows indicate complex or uncertain connections between uh, factors. We then moved on to clarify uh, the nature of the connections between factors as weak, medium, or strong. And finally, uh, in a consolidation phase, uh, we just got participants to agree on the map produced and the knowledge generated. We used the resulting systems maps to refine and extend the narrative of uh, the watering model. Uh, I must note here that participatory systems mapping is a complex systems approach, uh, probably worth a separate session of its own. Uh, but I have included some links uh, in the slides here, which might be useful as further reference. And it is my understanding that these slides will be made available uh, after today. The second type of uh, stakeholder engagement session we ran used flowcharts, uh, each showing a sequence of actions performed by different agents in the watering model, such as UA, farmers, pastoralists, and households. So stakeholders worked in small groups to review the flowcharts, commenting if the sequence of actions are experienced or expected from the different actors. 
the objective of the flowchart session was to allow stakeholders to evaluate the logic and the behavior of the model, or in other words, the way in which we uh, implemented uh, watering. Finally, uh, we ran another stakeholder engagement event called Watering Stories, uh, through which stakeholders evaluated the assumptions and the outputs of watering. But rather than presenting the assumptions and results as statistical charts, uh, we presented them as narratives and asked stakeholders to identify if the stories were far removed from reality, corresponded to reality, or sat somewhere in between. So our show, tell and discuss approach looks something like this, uh, where you can see a written description of the assumptions and results alongside plots and the pictorial depiction of the results. Uh, the story session was useful uh, for collecting stakeholders' opinions and reflections on the simulated results and their plausibility. Uh, I must note here that our stakeholders involved um, a, a different types of actors like extension officers, uh, who are members, uh, who are representatives, uh, and even uh, irrigation authorities. So, this slide here shows an overview of how we brought together the stakeholder feedback uh, gathered through the different sessions, and that this is only part of the feedback. Uh, we found that uh, watering assumptions and results aligned with some of the experiences and expectations of stakeholders shown in the green uh, box. Uh, for example, they agreed with certain assumptions and results about what actions, membership, water uses cooperation with the WUA and unregulated water use being a prevalent issue. On the other hand, uh, some of our assumptions and results either aligned partly or diverged from uh, stakeholder feedback, and that's shown in the red box. For example, they commented that mid-season water shortages in the scheme are less likely as the area cultivated in the scheme would be decided based on the amount of water available at the start of the season. So water shortages would still impact farming, irrigation and income generation, but instead of impacting directly how much water is available to users, it would impact the um, area of the land cultivated. Another point of disagreement was about UA strictness. Uh, stakeholders expressed that UA strictness should impact cutting off water supply, supplies entirely rather than rationing quotas. Um, and they expect that this would improve water users' cooperation with UA as well as boosting their income. At the same time, uh, stakeholders also agreed that uh, implementing the effect of UA strictness is not as straightforward um, uh, as they know from experience. We also got suggestions for new dimensions to consider in watering, for example, uh, members influencing and being uh, influenced by uh, one another through uh, UA membership. So, based on the feedback uh, we collected from stakeholders, we are in the final phase of uh, refining watering. Um, but in the meantime, as a researcher and agent-based modeler, I am keen to follow open research practices to promote the openness, transparency, and reusability of agent-based models. Um, I mean, like, let's consider all the great work uh, done by the open source software community, which allows us to use uh, libraries, packages, extensions, and the like, which make our work easy or even doable in some circumstances. In that spirit, we felt that the irrigation and crop growth submodels of watering uh, implemented in NetLogo could become components or building blocks useful in a range of socio-ecological systems modeling applications and have thus made them standalone components. As they stand now, uh, these models only simulate irrigation or irrigation and crop growth, but the idea is you can use them as building blocks and add new categories of agents and new procedures to model a socio-ecological system of interest to you. Um, you can download the NetLogo files and run them from the link shared in this slide. We will also pop these links uh, into the chat uh, if you'd like to try um, soon after now uh, when um, I finish the presentation. 
So um, a quick recap of the things I wish to achieve in this session before thanks and closing. So I wanted to share the experience and reflections from developing an agent-based model called Watering to explore decentralized water management through us based on real-world data for potential real-world application, which was co-developed with stakeholders and developed in an iterative fashion. I also touched on the importance of open research practices uh, and the usefulness of it in agent-based modeling. With that, I would like to thank all my future dance colleagues here in the UK and Ghana for their contributions to watering. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, happy to take questions. <laughs>